this is part of a tutorial created for students studying in the Ocean and Naval Architectural Engineering Discipline at Memorial University of Newfoundland's Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science in St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. Today's tutorial covers describing a ship using parametric methods. Furthermore, we're also going to look at a basic example of a parametric analysis and how it can be organized and conducted in Excel. The objective of today's tutorial is to increase your understanding of the way we as a profession describe a ship using parametric analysis. In the early stages of design, it is necessary to develop a consistent definition of possible designs. We achieve this by describing the design in terms of its principal dimensions and other parameters of interest. At the outset, it is resource prohibitive to develop a more detailed design that may prove unfeasible or suboptimal. To eschew this commitment, we instead create numerous parametric ship descriptions to reliably define the size of a vessel before we commit to a more detailed trade-off study. Early in this course, you'll be asked to think about and propose a vessel design. This raises a whole host of questions. What type of ship do I want to design? What's its mission or purpose? What types or qualities does the vessel need to have to fulfill this mission? Does it need to have any capabilities for submissions? What are the trade-offs required to meet more than one design objective, and how do I decide that balance? We're going to begin this elephantine process through our use of parametric analysis. By the end of today's lecture, you should be able to identify the constituent elements of a parametric analysis, describe the difference between point and set-based design, detail the three basic strategies of parametric design, explicate the fundamental ship design categories, and apply the primary design equation relationships to a design of your choosing. Let's consider the following scenario, which happens to be true by the by, only the names have been changed to sanitize the scenario. Reuters reported on March 30th, 2020, that freight rates for very large crude oil carriers, VLCCs, along the Middle Eastern Gulf to China route were assessed at about $180,000 per day on Monday, up from $125,000 on Friday, and a weekly low of about $90,000 a day on Wednesday, according to several shipbroking sources. Given the recent oil price wars and the need for floating storage capacity, traders are increasingly seeking to store oil on tankers as onshore space becomes increasingly scarce. In response to these new demands, a recent national conglomerate, Great Canadian Tanks and Stuff, is looking to procure a storage and transportation solution for crude distribution along the St. Lawrence Seaway and throughout the Great Lakes. Their procurement office has recently issued a tender and invitation to bid for the design of their latest fleet of tanker solutions. Your company, Desert Dog Ocean Innovation, has decided to submit a concept design for consideration. Your supervisor, Wiley C., has asked you, the most recent junior addition to the design office, to assess the design space and provide a summary of representative design parameters using parametric methods. Great Canadian Tanks and Stuff has provided the following minimum requirements at this stage of the process. A cargo capacity consists of bulk crude greater than 10,000 cubic meters, a complement of 24 persons, and a minimum endurance of 24 sea days per round trip voyage, 350 sea days per annum. Additionally, they'd like a vessel service speed of greater than 11 knots. From a philosophical perspective, ship designers are not individuals who seek to unnecessarily add as much complexity to a design as possible with each turn of the design spiral. Rather, much like a sculptor with a large block of stone, we begin with a general idea in mind and we slowly take away from one region or another, cutting away pieces of the space until what we have manifested is our rough or concept design. We then polish and grind away at various aspects, refining each section relative to both itself and the overall proportion of the design until we arrive at our final product. So ill-defined artistic simile aside, from a practical standpoint, where and how do we begin? The answer is, it depends. While ship design is very much based on science, there's a great deal of art and flexibility in the design. Just as a car model, such as a sedan, has a number of consistent features from company model to company model, there remains huge margins for variation depending on what individual factors the designers perceive as being most important to the peculiarities of the scenario they are designing for. In this way, when we say we are trying to generate an optimal design, it is very important to recognize that the definition of optimal is context dependent, and even if we found a way to identify all of the most preferred design details, the random variables present in the operational environment will mean that we will probably never truly design a single optimum ship for a task. There are two overall strategies employed in design. The first, or traditional approach, was first formally proposed by J. Harvey Evans, a professor of naval architecture at MIT, in 1959. Known as point-based design, in your previous study of naval architecture, you may have heard this referred to as the design spiral. The goal is to reach or identify a single point in the design space. 
Essentially, we as designers recognize that design issues such as resistance, weight, volume, stability, trim, etc. must be considered in sequence and then iterated to evaluate the effects of changes of one aspect to the remaining issues until a single design satisfying all constraints and considerations is reached. As a result, we end up with a base design that can be either developed in more detail or used as a reference compared to other designs in a trade-off analysis. The second approach is a systems-based approach in which we create a design by using a scientifically validated methodology to make the best design decisions we can given the information we have at the time. We keep our options open, trying to maximize the available volume of the design space for as long as possible without having to irrevocably commit to design conditions that constrain the direction we can move within the design space. In other words, we try to maximize our potential for as long as possible to keep flexibility in the design. As the design progresses, we use improved information, including input from multiple stakeholders, such as ship brokers, owners, design offices, statutory regulations, industry best practices, classification organizations, and a healthy dose of our own experience to refine the design space until we have identified a design region that encloses all of the design's key needs or variables. The analysis I'm demonstrating today is not exhaustive. It's meant more as a tutorial introducing you to some of the rationale and methodology behind some common design jumping off points. We're going to begin with a parametric analysis. Engineering students are usually already highly familiar with parametric equations in design, even if you're not already aware of it. If you look at the etymology of the word parametric, like many English and French words, it derives from Latin. That's not really important, but what is important is that the parameters refer to independent variables that are selected to define a relationship to a dependent variable, while metric is simply the suffix we add in English to create an adjective corresponding to words terminating in meter. So parametric design in naval architecture is the design of a ship or marine component using parameters or key variables to describe the relationship between design features. In naval architecture, we apply this process by identifying a couple of key variables and then employing any number of scientific methods to create relationships that describe other aspects of the design in terms of those key variables. In other words, we are creating a series of n equations in n unknowns and simultaneously solving them. If you recall your basics of equation systems, this means that for any given set of parameters, we might end up with a single solution, multiple solutions, or no solution that satisfies our equation requirements. The models are traditionally developed using linear regression of data graphed on Cartesian, semi-log, or log-log plots. However, recent computer-assisted statistical modeling packages have permitted multiple linear regression analysis, artificial neural networks, multi-criteria optimization and genetic algorithm methods, and other various methods of design. We're going to focus on the classical approach for two reasons. First, it is significantly more practical to apply with the resources and knowledge you have on hand as students, and these methods are still highly in use today. Secondly, if you understand the classical methods, it is a whole lot easier to understand how and why modern developments have moved in the direction that they have. D.G. Watson published a seminal paper in 1962 and a revision in 1976 entitled Some Ship Design Methods. It was considered mandatory reading in naval architecture programs for many years, and I strongly encourage you to hunt down a copy and read through it before you begin trying to tackle your own design. Many of the concepts are revisited in Watson's book, Practical Ship Design, but the discussion from fellow RENA members in the annex of the original paper is pretty worthwhile for improving your understanding of the ship design process. Alternatively, many other appropriate methods and relationships are described in Chapter 11 of Lamb's Ship Design and Construction. Both of these resources are available through SNAMI at a really good price for students, and they are also available to read in a digital copy through MUNS Library. If you're tuning in and don't have access to the online library, I have seen some older editions of these books in PDF form floating around the internet, and if your Google Foo is strong, I'm sure you can find them pretty easily. It would behoove you to read through the chapters on parametric design before attempting it on your own. Now that we've discussed what a parametric design is, let's take a deeper cut into how it's done. There are three basic approaches to parametric analysis, but the reality is that many designs begin by drawing elements from all three. The first approach uses a basis ship for design. It may be common to take a known or proven design and make changes to the design to fulfill new or extended concept of operations. Take for instance Canada's new JSS, which is a modified design based on that of Germany's Berlin class, or Davy's new MV Asterix, which was a container ship design retrofitted for auxiliary oil replenishment for the Navy. The second approach creates a large database of ships with similar operational profiles and missions to the design concept that you are hoping to generate. 
A quick search of naval architecture firms will quickly demonstrate that this method is in wide use today. For example, if you go and Google Vard Marine, you'll see that they proudly advocate their extensive repository of accepted designs and parametric derivations as a design basis for your needs. By creating a database that contains a wide variety of the key dimensions and characteristics of the ship, the parameters can be related to one another by graphing your key variables against other parameters. The, reg the regression lines created by these relationships may provide equations or allow ratios to emerge that can govern your design elements. In many cases, validated and accepted parametric equations have already been previously identified through empirical study by authors concerning a wide range of vessel types and applications. Nowadays, you can generally find good, reliable data about most ship particulars through any number of online sources, including technical specification sheets provided by other manufacturers, government databases, ship registry organizations, and dare I say it, sometimes even that beast that is Wikipedia. Finally, the third approach is the direct application of first principles, that is the governing equations of mathematics, physics, and engineering to the design of structural elements. If you're attempting a design that is a complete paradigm shift or a complete change in the nature of a way a structure has been traditionally built, you may opt to use first principles quite commonly. However, for more traditional designs, it's much more commonplace to see us refer back to either method one or method two. Today, we're going to examine the most popular method, parametric analysis by empirical evaluation. We begin by considering the design requirements provided by the ship owner. When you're examining design requirements, Scan them preliminarily for any immediate red flags that constrain a design. For instance, here the ship owner has specified a minimum speed and endurance, so this automatically begins to constrain the resistance and propulsion considerations, as well as the minimum tank loads which we may need. More importantly, consider the area of operation they've identified. Specifically, this class of ships is meant to operate in the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway. What does this mean in terms of the ship's needs for hydrodynamic performance, sea keeping, or something as basic as principal particulars? If you know anything about the seaway, you might know that there are length, beam, draft, and air draft restrictions on ships transiting this region. The limits are bounded by the dimensions of the lock in Sault Ste. Marie. Subsequently, we now know the upper limits on the principal dimensions in the design space. Reading through Watson, you'll see that naval architects commonly begin the selection of main dimensions by identifying which of three categories their intended design is governed by, be it deadweight carrier, in other words, displacement constrained, a capacity carrier, in other words, hull volume constrained, or a linear dimension ship, where the dimensions are primarily fixed by considerations other than deadweight or volume. As I've just highlighted, the seaway locks restrict our design to dimensions known as seaway max design, so we're clearly dealing with a linear dimension ship. So check out the table that's on the screen. I've begun by building a database of extant bulk oil tankers operating in the Seaway and Great Lakes. Using publicly available literature from the ship owner's websites, I've compiled key information requirements that may influence my design. Now, I'm aware that changes to the Seaway in the early 2000s have affected some design considerations, so I've removed any vessels that predate 2000 to keep them from skewing my data. Now, normally, you would have a much deeper range of vessels than this, if possible, but this is a demo, so I haven't gone into exhaustive detail. Consider the table. Where possible, I've populated the fields with available literature. By graphing some of the most common relationships, I can quickly visualize trends in the data. Moreover, I can run a regression to get an equation that fits the data, allowing me to make suitable design calculations. For simple ratios, I've calculated them directly, and for others, you'll see that the table is still left blank. I've done this for two reasons. First, many of these ratios require you to consider whether to use your own database equations or elect a different empirical model reported in the literature or design guidance. Alternatively, perhaps your organization may have an equation of form it prefers to use. The second reason, of course, is that this is a tutorial, and as you have been asked in your course assignments to exercise your own design knowledge and experience, I'm not going to give away all the answers. Just as in the design office you may soon find yourself working in, you'll have to explore the dark edges of the map a little on your own. The easiest way to track and manipulate your results is to create a design summary spreadsheet that tabulates all of your key parameters. There are many ways to do this, and those of you who are much more organized, or perhaps at least a little more pedantic than I am, may create much prettier spreadsheets. The important takeaway is that it is a best practice to have a single sheet that summarizes your values in a logical and organized manner, while providing any comments or explanatory notes, symbols, and abbreviations that would be essential for a client to make sense of the information.
you should use subsequent sheets to produce your actual calculated design values. Remember that throughout the course of your design, you may need to update or change these values multiple times. So when you build your relationships, you should try and use a cascading approach where the input of some equations is the resultant output of others. Ultimately, you're trying to link as many of these equations as possible back to a few key independent parameters. With that said, let's take a quick look at how that might look. Following guidance from LAM, and based on what we just discussed regarding the seaway, I'm going to use the length, beam, and depth as my key parameters. In actual application, a common approach would be to choose three representative magnitudes, say a low, medium, and high value from your analysis, and create three basis designs, which you could then use to conduct a trade-off analysis. There's no rule on how many designs you could or would create, but the three-point estimate is a common theme in engineering and project management. But in general, the idea is to create a number of models to fill the design space. I'm only going to work with one model here. I just wanted you to be aware how the scenario might play out in the more organic context of an actual design office. From my data analysis, I've observed that a good median length between perpendiculars seems to be 120 meters, with a beam of 20 meters and a depth of 10 meters. So I'm going to use these as my key independent variables. Now, I've laid out my summary page in terms of principal design parameters, weights, volumes, and centers, and resistance and propulsion characteristics. Then, I've combed through various sources of parametric equations and identified the equations that are best suited for the vessel size range and operational profile I'm interested in designing for. Take, for instance, a range of block coefficient parametric equations that may exist for ships of different speed length ranges. Similarly, when we're selecting equations, we need to be cognizant of the units used in the equation. Just because equations are listed sequentially in a textbook or paper, it does not mean that they're configured to operate in direct form with one another. As a result, we may need to conduct unit conversions or rewrite equations in terms of the variables we want to solve for versus the variables we've already deduced. In an actual office, this whole process may be a long effort with other competing demands on your time. As a result, you should incorporate your source or methodology in your sheets so that if you need to revisit your sheets or revise them, you can quickly identify which equations you used for your design and why you chose those equations. In my sheets, I throw the equations in a separate column along with the source. In the event I may have transcribed an equation incorrectly, this helps me track the original source quickly. Many people use screenshots or snipping tools to create screen grabs of equations and drop them directly into their design sheets for ease of reference. As you go through a parametric design, you may find yourself backtracking. For instance, your machinery weight might use an empirical value based on a maximum continuous rating, but you won't evaluate your maximum continuous rating until you estimate your resistance and propulsion characteristics. The use of secondary design sheets allows you to create placeholder or dummy variables to define cells that haven't yet been populated, allowing you to reference these in your other parametric equations and other sheets. The result is that your design may develop non-linearly, and you should be aware of this going into it. Given that we've now gone through all these steps, how do we decide when we're finished iterating? Ultimately, perhaps the most straightforward method is to select criteria that satisfy a solution. In the case I'm demonstrating, everything has been solved in such a way that I can determine weights and displacements. For me, an acceptable solution will find the weight and displacement balanced out. Each time I consult my design, if these values are not balanced, I have to make adjustments to my independent variables until I've built a working solution. With time and practice, you'll gain experience that guides your intuition concerning how the variables interact. But at first, it may very much involve some trial and error to navigate the design space. Finally, use the engineering judgment you've developed up until this point in your career. If you're building a container ship, a quick look at the designs out there would suggest just by visual inspection, they are mostly wall-sided. This makes sense from a scientific perspective when you consider that a cube maximizes volume for surface area. Thus, ships that approach cubes as best as possible tend to maximize volumetric capacity. From a naval architecture perspective, this should suggest to you that the ship would have a fairly full block coefficient. If your calculations suggest otherwise, you need to critically evaluate whether you have used the wrong equation, selected inappropriate inputs, made a mistake when applying the mathematics of the equation, or does your design actually justify what the math is telling you? Ultimately, as designers, we have to recognize that these equations are predominantly empirical relationships, and they are simply tools to help guide our design in an efficient manner. They're not dogmatic, prescriptive requirements, and treating them as such is going to give you a design which may be suboptimal and unesthetic.
So practice your art with your science. A great design is some balance of the two. So let's summarize what we've discussed today. Today I introduced a basic example of the parametric analysis process and demonstrated the interrelationship between various aspects of naval structural design. We discussed the classical and modern approach to parametric model development, and we created a basic design vocabulary that allows us as designers to communicate with one another from a common perspective in order to create a consistent parametric description of a vessel in its early design. I also highlighted some influential resources you can use to increase your understanding of the basic design relationships and procedures. At this point, you should have an adequate understanding to begin to tackle tasks number one and two of assignment number one. Namely, construct a shipping scenario of your choice, identify the type of vessel and its purpose, identify the payload you are planning to carry, identify any environmental restrictions that may affect your design, and conduct a parametric study and selection of vessel particulars. If you need some guidance on identifying a vessel and articulating its purpose, please check out the video on marine vehicle types. If you're struggling to develop a shipping scenario, please refer to the videos on mission statements and concepts of operation. Thanks for watching, and if you have any questions or feedback, please leave them in the comments or send me an email. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. It's the best way I can think of to alert you to new published content to help you with your design questions.